five bay doors, please. Huh? I'm going to inject you with what we believe we've isolated as the gay gene. I don't understand. Well, if we're correct, we will have successfully proven that homosexuality is genetic and not a matter of choice or environment. Are you crazy? I don't want to take a chance on being gay. We'll give you $125. All right, I'll do it. Boy, you're more persuasive than James Bond. Now, time for some unfinished business. No, James. Yes. No, James. Yes, you are going to have sex with me. No, James, I don't want to. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Okay, yes. See that? 50 no's and a yes means yes. The pod bay doors are open. Welcome once again. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Roberts of armchaircinema.com and also armchairoscars.com. Here with our man in the field, the critic, dare I say legend, DoomTalkMovieMe.com, Mr. Doug Heller. How the heck are you today, sir? World domination. Shame old dream. Our silence are full of people who think they're Napoleon. Oh, God. <laughs> Short but sweet. Uh, welcome to um, good Volume line. 1. Welcome yeah. to Volume 1. Of what we hope will be an ongoing series, um, we're going to talk about James Bond pictures. Um, it, we're we're going to do this over time because we've got three months coming up. Of, because of this being... this would be the worst possible franchise month imaginable. Oh God, <laughs> I, I couldn't do this. We're talking about James Bond. I I couldn't do this as franchise month. Um, <laughs> all of it all the way through because it's basically the same movie 25 times <laughs> because let me tell you something if you try and spend a weekend watching these movies it will drive you insane because they're oh. basically the same movie i i tried to do i bought i have the um that big old blu-ray box set that goes all the mm -hmm. way up through specter so i have yeah. all 24 oh, currently anniversary? yeah i have all the 24 of the current released ones mm -hmm. and uh i hadn't seen when i first bought it most of the things from the 60s i'd seen dr no from russia with love and goldfinger what we're doing today mm -hmm. but i had not watched moonraker and thunderball and honor majesty's secret service and most of the roger moore all of the, mm -hmm. the both timothy dalton movies i hadn't seen any of them so I'm like, okay, I'm going to do a James Bond marathon. And I start with Dr. No. I got to about Honor Majesty's Secret Service or maybe Thunderball just after. And I had to stop. Because <laughs> and it, and that, was like, that was like a week and a half later. I'm like, I can't. I can't it is like things. trying to remember a joke from Family Guy. It's like you can't remember what scene comes from what movie. Unless you are a devotee. Which is exactly why I re-watched From Russia With Love today, this morning, when, before we recorded, because that was the one that I could remember the least amount about. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, Goldfinger, he wants to rob Fort Knox. And then Dr. No, the he's got like... the big nuclear thing. Oh, it's a typewriter. They're after a goddamn typewriter. And then you watch the movie and you're like, okay, I, I know now why I can't remember this. Yeah, exactly. Um, because I watched all three of these in the same night. Nice. And... My God, that must have felt like Groundhog Day. My, um, <laughs> no, that weekend that I tried to watch all of them, that, that felt <laughs> like Groundhog Day. Um, this is one of, this is the most utility series ever given to the public, because... You don't make a Bond film. You plug it in. It, right. Unless right. you are trying to get a new actor. A, a um, Bond movie... Bond and movies, I'm not downing... I'm not downing... No, no. I, lo I love this series. I'm not, they're, I'm not they're, de they're, denigrating they it. They tend to... Most of them are at least entertaining. Yeah. They're very... Um, inter a lot of them are very entertaining. But... What every what what people are critical of the Marvel movies of mm -hmm. like the 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 formula and the standard, it's more on display for a Bond movie. Mm -hmm. um, because once they get into the seventies and it's 
pre-credit sequence where there's an explosion that might have something tangentially to do with the rest of the movie, but usually nothing at all. And then naked ladies on uh, uh, dancing on the screen for a couple minutes, and mm-hmm. then it gets into the plot, which means nothing. The plot never means a damn thing. Because it's always, almost always the same. It's, it's a MacGuffin every time, because it's just to get him places. Well, this is... Um... It's what I like to call a magnet franchise, because it's a, uh, when a, when an entry comes out, it's like Star Wars or Star Trek. Mm-hmm. People are magnetized to it and automatically go and see it. Well, because no matter it's... what, because it doesn't matter because the brand name. Well, it's been around since 1962. I mean, right. when when you have a franchise that's able to basically anthologize itself without having to discount any of the stuff that came before it, mm. you're going to do it. It's it's like Doctor Who. It can go yeah. on indefinitely as long as they can as long as they can model it to the way things are changing the way and make it that new they have enough. had yeah the way that they've had to do um the newer bond movies mm. that style of fake espionage from the movies doesn't work as well in today's world with well, the technologies that we have part of it is because and we'll get to the we're we're gonna get to dr no in a second but the part of the reason is that the imitators are no longer following bond bond now has to follow the imitators there's the jason Bourne series there's all of that other stuff there's the tom clancy movies there's all all those things that have been bred from what bond create what the bond series created oh, yeah. and, and the mission impossible four through whatever eight million that they're on um are better than many bond movies and they always advertise with those mission impossible movies okay well here's a stunt that we were working on and here's how we're doing it and it's exciting it's exciting the thing is the Bond films have gotten away from that, and now they're trying to get more toward a personality. Mm-hmm. Um, that's Which Bond why, doesn't really have. Well, that's one of the reasons that I so love Casino Royale. The the Daniel Craig movie, not the Dan, not the David Niven thing. Oh, now come um, on, man. That's a fun, <laughs> stupid little thing. I'm talking about within this series. Casino Royale is my favorite because it did something new. Um, it put Bond back in this tough, steely, hard exterior and sort of explored how difficult that is for him to maintain. And the fact that he can't have a relationship and do what he does. Right, because it... Um, it, it invariably interferes um it's what the, the in the in the, the the daniel craig ones was it he had a he had a girlfriend and then she double crossed him and then she died and then she came back and then uh right v- vespa vesper oh yes okay it's not a little motor she uh, motorized um, scooter she's a she uh <laughs> well the Daniel Craig movies are trying to do, or are doing, what the Pierce Brosnan movies wanted to do and didn't. There's a line in Goldeneye when the woman's, the, you know, it challenges, this woman challenges him. And he says, it's what keeps me alive. And she says, no, it's what keeps you alone. Mm-hmm. And it's like the movie went to that sort of edge, but then pulled back from it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a scene in Tomorrow Never Dies where he meets Terry Hatcher, and Terry mm-hmm. Hatcher is an old love of his. And it's not... Um, it's, a, it, it, it's a personal relationship that the movie then pulls away from. Mm-hmm. The Daniel Craig movies don't do that. Right. Especially Casino, Casino Royale, because that's a, that, that's a reboot. 
and it's going back to his beginnings and showing how he's learning so a lot I of have things. A, I have a question for you in terms of the entire series. Okay. I, in order to make sense of it, have decided that every time there's a new James Bond, mm -hmm. there is a new person who is saying, who, whose name is now James Bond, 007. That the name is the same for the number. When you get promoted to a double O and you get 007, your name is James Bond. And you are this top seek this top spy and it's it's more of a of a name it's like batman symbol it doesn't matter who's in the costume as long as there's somebody oh you're there. saying who yeah well it, it can go that way i just but um, that's the only way that i can uh make him young in 1962 uh in his in his mid thirties in nineteen sixty two and in his mid nineteen ninety six and in his mid forties uh in twenty twenty one. I can't right. otherwise if if they're not all different people, if it's supposed to be the same person, none of it mm -hmm. makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, there's not a narrative sense. They're, they're, they try for narrative in this series sometimes and it doesn't work. Um they tried um I remember Honor Majesty's Secret Service he gets married, and then she dies. And later on, they try to deal with that in the in the Roger Moore series, but they don't really deal with it because it's like it's it's kind of a road they don't want to go down. Right. Um, there, that happens a lot in this series. Um, but the problem, and I was telling you this before we recorded, the problem with this series is. He's so of the of the early '60s and so of the Kennedy era that it is very, very, very hard to turn him around and change this character and change this series as the world changes. Mm -hmm. When you get into, um, particularly as you approach the end of the Cold War, and he no longer has the Cold War to deal with, and. Um, and especially, you know, in the mid '80s, when you had to deal with AIDS. Yeah. And because when they when they were making the Living Daylights, the first Timothy Dalton movie, that was something that they had to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, because you can't just fall into bed with anybody, because everybody's always aware of the problems of casual sex. Right. Um, so they've had to, they have stumbled and fumbled over their own feet trying mm -hmm. to make this character relevant. Right, because I mean, sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. Even even um, Judy Dench as M, which I loved her yeah. as M, um, and I'm glad that they kept her from the Pierce Brosnan. They kind of continued yeah. the trend of keeping the same M, which also leads me to believe that they are not the same person, mm -hmm. because M is the same now, for M all is, of yeah, the M different is a people. Title, yeah, M yeah. is the title, so M you know he but it's the same actor throughout yeah. all of the going through and then it's judy dench and she's the same going through skyfall and now it's it Ray is Fiennes. marvelous it is marvelous in golden eye when she sits down plops his butt down in front of her desk and says you know basically says i don't like you i think you're a sexist misogynistic dinosaur a relic of the cold war Mm -hmm. And it's like she's speaking to the series and establishing a challenge that the series from that point on then has to overcome and has to deal with. Mm -hmm. Because that's the first Bond film after the fall of the Soviet Union. Right. So there's there's the... Uh, there's that essence that the basically the thing that he was created to symbolize the fight of is now gone yeah so what do you do now mm. for craig for craig's reboots and stuff it was a little easier because 9 11 had happened yeah. yeah so this amorphous global terrorism mm -hmm. is a real thing the and he idea, doesn't, and there are the times when he does specter. not know who he's fighting. Right, exactly. 
and the the concept of specter is actually more relevant now than it was in the 60s mm. well the other thing is um when you get down to it they do a very good job of quality control mm-hmm. because this series while it does repeat itself um is a very reliable it's about as reliable as television you mm-hmm. know when you have characters and you know you give them catchphrases and you, you give them personality traits and you give them this and you go this. but and you rarely break away from that mm-hmm. so uh the thing about Bond is he's just distant enough from us. Mm-hmm. We don't know that much about him. Um, his personal life rarely ever comes into the rarely ever comes into question, and so it's it's a fantasy. So they leave out all, right. all of that personal stuff. Mm-hmm. So that you can have a hero who doesn't have a personal life and who doesn't have all of the intricacies and doesn't have the home life and all of that stuff. So, it again, it is a total fantasy. Right. And I always saw Bond as Hefner's playboy philosophy. You know, mm-hmm. the okay. a good-looking man. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got a, a great tailor. Yes. <laughs> Yes, he he's does. got all the gadgets. He beds all these all these gorgeous women, mm-hmm. and he gets to go around the world to every con- every corner of the earth. And it's a total male fantasy. Oh yeah, bred from the Kennedy era. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the funny thing. Now I've read several of Ian Fleming's books. Okay, I never have. Okay, the character on the screen is not the character on the page. There are a lot of videos. I did a deep dive on this. There are a lot of videos online comparing and contrasting who is the closest Bond to Ian Fleming's original um, vision of the character. Hilariously, it was David Niven. No, Acor- according it wasn't. to according to Fleming, it was David Niven. Not really. Okay. Hear me out. The character in the book is much colder, Mm -hmm. is much more single-minded, he's narcissistic, he focuses very often on the wrong thing, he moves in directions that, um, he often moves in directions that you're you're, you're wondering what he's doing, even though he's succeeding. Right. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, you know, among the six actors that he that have played the character, I'm sorry, the character that he most resembles is Archer. Oh, absolutely. He's That's... basically, in the book, he's basically Archer. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Archer even uses the Walther PPK yeah. that, that Bond does, and... Uh, yeah, basically, yes, yes. Um, ex- <laughs> except I would wager that uh, Archer is slightly more vulgar when he speaks. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. In the book, not in the book, um, Dr. No, mm-hmm. there's more than one reference to yellow faced bastard. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it happens more than once. Oh, I'm um, sure. So they they pulled a lot of his racism. They pulled his racism out of the out of the out of the the film series. Yes, the sexism but can stay. They, they the didn't... sexism. Can... Yeah. They didn't take racism out of it. They just took his racism out of his it. His racism. Because they I mean, man <laughs> alive. The woman in, that woman in Dr. No that walks in and she's, this woman is clearly German. Because she's, this woman is clearly German. 
she's got blue eyes and she's supposed to be Asian. And I'm, and when she walked yeah. in, I thought, okay, you are a, you are about as Asian as my Chihuahua. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's that, and um, to get to Doctor No, um, mm-hmm. moving on to Doctor No, the only black guy in the movie is the dies. only good guy that dies, and he Quarrel. is immolated by a tank. <laughs> Quarrel. He, is, he immolated. is immolated by a tank. He's just laying on the ground shooting, and they just walk. They just drive over to him, and and he just. Yeah. It's, Dying, it's the most appalling thing, and and James Bond likes lighting people on fire. I mean, it happens. I think in at least two of these three mm-hmm. movies, because mm-hmm. I know it happens in From Russia with Love, and I know it happens there. Uh, well, let me put it this way: if you watch the other James Bond movies. And my my personal history is this. I started when I was a kid watching James Bond movies. Um, I think I, I think the first one I ever saw was probably Spy Who Loved Me. And um, I've seen every James Bond movie in the theater, going all the way back to View to a Kill. Wow. Um. From View to a Kill all the way up to Spectre, I've seen every one of them, every one of those in the theater. Hmm. But you go back, but then you go back to Doctor No, and boy, it's a mind bender. Yeah. Because the opening of this movie, the the gun sight mm-hmm. comes out. The gun sight is these little Atari noises, these little um, weird kind of electronic noises, and. Um, then they do the gun barrel, and they play the theme song, and then all of a sudden this Caribbean music comes in, and these people are dancing, and it's like they're playing this weird um, three blind mice. Number. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then this the the the, the um, blind men are walking across the road. If you're if you're used to Moonraker, or you're used to Spy Who Loved Me. Or you're used to Thunderball with the the classic opening, with the floating naked women. Right. This will twist your brain because it's like, what the heck is this? Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean. I, uh, <laughs> a lot in these things make you kind of wonder what they were thinking. Yeah. And how how well, they? I mean. They didn't know. No, they had no idea that they were building one of the most popular series. You know that would still be going on in well into the twenty first century. Nobody had any idea about that. Right. Um, probably the longest running consistent series um, in movie history. In movies, yeah. One mm-hmm. of them. Um, but I will say that even as I put on my critical cap for these films. All three of them are basically very, very entertaining. Oh, sure. Um, Doctor No is a little takes a little time because it's the first one, and you can feel the series finding its way. Mm-hmm. Um, the plot is very strange. It's, um, it's unfocused to beat the band. There's it's not... very it's very unfocused. There's there's never really a clear like I have no idea why he's in Jamaica. I, I don't know either. I have no idea. He just they're like, oh well, now you have to go here. Okay, it's like I have no idea why. Um, and the because it's a beautiful location. Well, yeah. I mean, it's they go to the Caribbean and uh the gulf of mexico all the time for the same reasons the that the beatles wanted to film the last little bit of help there is because it was nice yeah they wanted a little holiday so (laughs) so they kind of build that in so i half of the time it just looked like it was a a a triptych for uh uh, sean connery's vacation Mm -hmm. um and 
it was like Adam Sandler making a movie in Las Vegas just because he wanted to go on vacation there. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, it is, it is unfocused. It's not uninteresting. It's it, not uninteresting at all. No, it's, it's a good movie. It is. But like most James Bond movies, I, I lose track of it somewhere around the halfway mark. Yeah. Um, and that's the same for every James Bond movie I've ever seen. With the mm -hmm. exception of Goldeneye, that was my first one. Um, that is a weird place to start. I was 14, and it was the first Bond that I was really able to go see. Mm -hmm. Really? I was only eight when um, you, only, you Only Live Twice came out. Wasn't that in 88, 88 or 89? And then, uh, no, that was The Living Daylights and then License yeah. to Kill. Yeah, but that was like 85, 86, and then 87, 89, somewhere in there. I was too young. Mm -hmm. So Pierce Brosnan was my first Bond, factually. Well, my first my first Bond was Roger Moore. Um, Mo many people's first Bond was Roger Moore. <laughs> well, because Roger Moore made more Bond films than anybody else. Right. Um, most actors who are successful at this, five movies is, is their limit. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe five movies. And then once they're done with it, you couldn't get him back. You couldn't get him back into the series at gunpoint, right? Um, which was what happened with Sean Connery because he was just like, um, "There's a, um, there's a legend, <laughs> there's a legendary story." Um, he had made six Bond films, and he was on the set of I think it was The Man Who Would Be King. Mm -hmm. And he was taking a break, and he looked up, and he saw um, Cubby Broccoli walking toward him, and he went, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, that was in 1975. He'd already, he'd been out of her for a while. He, yeah, no, he, yeah. Every, <laughs> the only, and the only person that I think never really got his fair shake was Timothy Dalton. Yeah, he never got his shake because um, he's very good. He's very good Bond. The two yeah. movies he's in are not. Are not. At all. And that's, mm -hmm. that's why he didn't get more than two. Mm -hmm. And why Pierce Brosnan replaced him six years later, even though he was perfectly capable. Well, they, I'm wanted, sure. him, they wanted him to play the role then. But he was under contract. Uh, I think it was uh, Spence. Was, no, Remington Steele. Mm. Um, he was on. He was already on. He was still on television. Right. So it was hard for him to. You know, he couldn't do both. Right. And um, so he had to wait. Mm -hmm. um, but this movie, Doctor No. I want to talk about how it starts because he's. Well, they murder this guy, and then they murder his secretary, the three blind mice. Mm -hmm. And we go into a casino where he's playing this weird version of, of Baccarat. And we see this really, really beautiful woman, uh, Sylvia Trench, and she looks at him. Talk about an entrance. Oh, man, and it's this... like 45 minutes in. This has got to be the coolest entrance ever by anyone in anything. Because she says something, um, see, what was it she like, says? I, I admire your luck. And she goes, I admire your luck too. He's like, I admire your luck, Mish. And he's Trench, off screen Sylvia still, Trench. Mr. And she goes, Trench, Sylvia Trench. And I admire yours, Mr. And then it cuts to him lighting a cigarette. Bond. Bond. James, James Bond. Bond. That's a moment. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what flaws this movie may have, that's a moment. Um, and also, really the creation of a movie star. Mm -hmm. And I just, it's, it's funny, um, I just wrote a, uh, a review of Cry Macho, which I was talking about the death of movie stars. Mm -hmm. 
And the fact that we just lost Sean Connery, yeah, uh, just it, it signals just the end of, of real movie stars. We don't have them anymore. But it was interesting to go back to we this have, now because we, we have, have some. We have some, but we don't we don't have the movie stars. You know, we don't have a John Wayne. We don't have the big. We don't have an Ingrid Bergman. No, but we have we a Cary have, Grant. We have a Cary Grant. We just don't. They don't build movie stars like that because they build celebrities so fast, so thick and fast that it's just right. Like the you know. the the movie movie star stars that we have, George Clooney, you know, mm-hmm. maybe Brad Pitt, Julia Roberts, mm-hmm. um, and they're getting older. They are. They're all um, over fifty. The young people that are coming along, I don't know one from the other anymore. No. Um, unless that's they're not in a, a good thing to start role. admitting. <laughs> What's that? Is that that's not a good thing to start admitting? Then you just sound like an old man. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's true. It's like you know, I hear these people now, and it's like, um, unless they're in a definable role, or unless I see their work coming up, I don't know who they are anymore. Well, you know, I'm kind of the same way with a lot of pop culture, pop culture stuff and contemporary music. Um, my Family and I watch uh, The Masked Singer, mm-hmm. and uh, I'd say 60-40 split, when they take that mask off, I don't know who the hell they are. Yeah. <laughs> they pull it off, and everybody's like, oh my god, and I'm like, who is it? Unless it's Terry Bradshaw or somebody like that. Well, I mean, yeah, they're they're like I'll I'll recognize about forty percent of the people, and sometimes I'll get their voices, like when Gladys Knight and uh, 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 Patty Labelle were on. You can you can hear their voices, and you know who that is. Mm-hmm. But when JoJo Siwa took her mask off, mm-hmm. they're like, "It's JoJo Siwa." Who? the hell is that <laughs> who? my wife and i had no idea who she was and my son did um but he's 17 so mm. it's, i think yeah. he's about the same age so yeah i'm i'm kind of with you on that in um just the people that are famous today the younger people that are famous are not um distinguishably famous right they're usually like internet famous and like some people a a a a group of people know who they are but Mm -hmm. the 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 people that were like you were saying you know the old time movie stars from the 20s 30s 40s 50s and they all had their thing yeah and they were household names. Mm-hmm. Many of the contemporary stars don't have that. Mm-hmm. Um, Miles Teller isn't even a household name. No. Uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt isn't a household name. And he's McDormand is probably not a household name. Uh, uh, yeah, and she's won three Oscars, mm-hmm. two in the last several years, mm-hmm. and you know most people might not even realize who she is until you say four oscars no fargo three billboards and uh nomadland two for nomadland i'm talking acting not yeah but she has four oscars (laughs) she has three anyway i'm sorry sorry that's like calling Brad Pitt a, uh, a an Oscar winner before he won for his supporting actor because he was t- his name got attached to Twelve Years a Slave somehow. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, and it's just back in the old days, you know, an actor had their thing. You know, Jimmy Cagney had the had the gangster pictures. You know, Cary Grant had the romance. And, you know, Jimmy Stewart had the all was the all American boy, and you know you had you had that. They all had their thing. Nowadays, there's so much media exposure. I don't know one 
one be a person from another. And I saw something the other day. So and so is getting a divorce, and I'm like, I have no idea who you are. Yeah. Who? It's just another guy with a weird haircut. And I was like, okay, I don't know who you are, but I know Sean Connery. And it's it's amazing to me to watch him in this film, and just how comfortable he is in this role. And this is the very first James Bond movie. Mm -hmm. He's so comfortable in this. Oh yeah. Um, he was a model. He was Mr. Universe. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Yeah, he was Mr. Universe. Uh, and he had been he had been an actor for a number of years. This just took him to a different place. People knew who he was, but this just took him to a different place. Right. Um, he did. And uh, this, this, without, without Dr. No, we probably really wouldn't know who Sean Connery is. Right. Um, well, and the, uh, the, the great thing about Connery is he built a career unlike the other actors, built a long-standing career after Bond mm -hmm. that is enviable to anyone. Oh, sure. Would be enviable to any actor. And he's um, the only one that's won an Oscar. But yes, yes. And the fun, But the funny thing is, he's so limited as an actor because every movie that Sean Connery's ever in, he's playing Sean Connery. Yeah. Including it's, when it's he's playing, same. including when he's playing Spaniards from Egypt with a Scottish yeah, accent in the Highlander, <laughs> or when he's playing an Irish cop in the Untouchables. You know? <laughs> it's yeah. When whenever he yeah he 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 didn't have a lot of range, mm -hmm. but he was good in what he did, um, and people loved it. Oh yeah. And that's that's the other thing is, is um, during this time, is that they all had a distinct personality. I've always liked to say um, impressionists don't have anything to work with anymore. Yeah, no. You know they don't have anything to work with anymore. Back then, you could do impressions of of Jimmy Cagney, of uh, of Edward G. Robinson, of Cary Grant. You know, you could do impressions of Catherine Hepburn. You can't mm -hmm. do impressions of these. Who does an impression of George Clooney? You know what I, mean? I can't even really? figure how to do one. He doesn't have how any. How you would do one. There's no you know, catchphrases. I mean, He's there's no funny quirk to his voice. Unless the best... you talk with your head like turned. Like... Yeah, but even still, I mean, the the best you've got now nowadays to uh, to impersonate is like Jay Leno. Yeah. Yeah. And you know maybe, maybe hosts of different shows like Steve Harvey or uh, Drew Carey or you know pe Letterman. people, yeah Letterman people that are just on um, comedians that can that that have the ability to uh, that are out there people can. But do. also remember they're also older and they came from that generation. Mm -hmm. But. Um... What's interesting about this movie is it's it's you can feel the Bond aesthetic getting on its feet, but it's not really there. Mm -hmm. The beautiful women are there. The location is there. The plot is there. The Cold War stuff is there, but you can still feel it getting on its feet. And I don't know if, I don't know about you, but this is the first time that I've, I've ever seen this movie where I realized that they're trying to build something. Mm -hmm. They're trying to build Bond to get to eventually get to Spectre and Blofeld. Right. They don't. They kind of hint around it, but they don't actually say Spectre or anything until what this one or uh, in uh, from Russia Spectre with Love. Spectre doesn't come up till the second one. Yeah, from Russia with Love. Um. Man, they really needed to hire a better dubber. Yeah, the sound in all of these is weird. It's like well, the um, the actress Eunice Gason, who plays um, Sylvia Trench. If you watch the trailer to this, you can hear her voice. Her voice is slight, pitched slightly higher. They dubbed all of her lines. Mm -hmm. 
and you're like, and you watch, I watch the trailer, and I'm like, okay, her voice sounds fine. Why did they, you know, it, it's right, a little strange. Right, right. And, and while, you're, while I was watching it, every now and again, I'm like, oh, the person in, a, in some recording booth is concerned. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Or you're watching their lips and it, Boy, the and voiceover it is really good actor. Yeah. <laughs> like and and Oh, I got a question for you. Yeah. What in the world does Ursula Andrews have to do with this plot? Her father got killed by Dr. No? Is is her father got killed by cuz she comes into this movie when it's almost over. It's it's a good hour and probably fifteen minutes before she even comes into this movie, mm-hmm. and it's and, worth it. Yeah, it's worth <laughs> it. But you're sitting there, and you, you you know, you expect her to be in the third scene, and she comes in way late in this movie. Mm-hmm. And um, other than that, other than her father got killed by a doctor, no, she really doesn't have a whole lot to do. No, but. Then again, she really doesn't need to do much. Right. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, this, because this is a very, very stringy plot. Because basically, the movie is just leaning them toward getting to Doctor No. Right. All all it is is uh, the whole the whole getting to that island is really just let's get them to this island. Yeah. Like nothing, nothing of great import happens Mm -hmm. yet. The plot couldn't have moved forward without it, without any of it. It's, it's all their MacGuffin game is very strong in, in the James Bond verse. From Russia with love is the same way. Oh yeah. From Russia with love is the same way. Yeah. Um, but I want to talk about Joseph Weissman for a second because <laughs> this is a Jewish actor uh, playing an Asian. And that's always been uncomfortable. It's not just now in the politically correct world. That has always been uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, just painting the, the eyelids and all of that stuff. His makeup is bad to boot. But you know, it's it's not Alec Guinness's Prince Faisal, mm-hmm. or yeah. or yeah. or um, hell, even Orson Welles's Othello. This is just bad makeup work, along yeah. with the insult that it is not an Asian actor playing an Asian person. <laughs> well, here's the funny thing: one of the tropes that they do in this movie is he brings Bond in and sits him down to dinner. Now that's a trope that will continue forever. Oh yeah, but he serves him like grapes. It's like he's got a dinner plate in front of him. He's just got like grapes. Yeah, or something I don't. On his plate. Uh... <laughs> Enjoy your last meal. What? <laughs> that's all we have. We're on a tropical island, for heaven's sake. <laughs> Hopefully he won't be around long enough for that to, for for an only fruit dinner to become a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I say this with affection. Doctor No is fine. It, it's fine. I'm not in love with it. It's not the best Bond by by a country mile it's not mm-hmm. the best best bond film it's kind of aimless um as i was watching it the other night i'm like there's there's not a lot to this and no i mean goldfinger is probably the best of the three weird the maybe even the best of the connery for me but the best thing that they do in this is they try to build a character because um when he shoots that guy you know, when he's in his little bungalow and he shoots that guy and Connery doesn't even blink. Mm-hmm. That's Bond. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's the character he's going to build for the next six films that he makes. Which which one is it that he's that he's underwater, that he has to go underwater? Um, was that... Uh, I think that's Thunderball. Uh, Thunderball. Um, 
All I remember about that movie is that seven people got harpooned in the chest. Ooh. <laughs> See, that's another thing. It's like this movie um, and this series, again, quality control. When he kills someone, it's not... It's unpleasant, but it's not blood and guts. Well, it's not graphic, but it is gruesome. Right, it's not graphic. It is gruesome. And it's um, gruesome. The, uh, the continual immolations are really disturbing. <laughs> I mean, there was, there was, there was the poor, poor guy on Dr. No's Island. Then there was that whole boat full of people in from Russia with love. Um, yeah. There's, there's well, gotta they kind of be... brought it on themselves because they had a bad captain. Well. Because yeah. when he starts dumping the, uh, the thing, when he starts dumping the gas barrels, he tells them to slow down. Right. I mean, you know. Well, at least, at least in that instance, um, it wasn't like other action movies where, you know, the cars or the boats are actually made out of explosives. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the three blind mice when they go off a cliff. Right. And their uh, and their their car just for no reason explodes. Their car explodes before it hits anything. If well, you're watching that, it goes off the road. It goes over the side. And then it blows up. It doesn't even hit anything first. It just blows up. <laughs> and nobody tries to get out. <laughs> yeah, what's with that? And not only that, but I love it. This is a continual thing, is that when a car blows up, it's not the car that blows up. It's the ground around it. <laughs> it's like this wide explosion that's like three feet away from the car, that comes from three feet away from the car so it's not the car that blows up it's the ground under it but it's like every car that tumbles off a cliff has to catch on fire mm -hmm. <laughs> somehow some way yeah it's it's like it's just made out of explosives yeah <laughs> and 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 the times where they're going through a city center and they don't knock over a fruit cart i get very confused oh yeah yeah there has to be a there has to be a fruit cart knock over there has to be a fruit cart knock over um did you see the family guy episode where stewie and brian had to go to europe to get mag who had been sold into human trafficking yes and they're driving around it's like okay this is the part where we, <laughs> this is the part where we inexplicably only see a stunt man you know <laughs> to the car it's a guy with a helmet <laughs> It's like that. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a Bond film later where they're driving up to a house and he's with this girl and they're in the front they're they're driving and when they pull up to the house, they're switched. It's like he's driving and she's the passenger, but when they pull up to the to the house, they're the other way around. It's like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And um you now we now notice those things because we watch these movies over and over again. Um, but again, Doctor No, it's fine. I'm not, I'm not in right, love no, with it. And, it's and, not. No, it's, it's it's very entertaining. It's a it's a it's it's a good watch. Um, it's a good introduction for the character. It's a it's a mm -hmm. it's a good place to start. Um, and from Russia with Love is about the same. It's Russia with Love is about the same. Um, from Russia with Love is trying to build more of a, um, it's trying to, it, it builds a lot further towards Spectre. Um, although they call themselves number one, number two, number three. And uh, it's all about them trying to get this, this Lecter, which is this decoding device. Right. It's, it's... And what I figured out, and I didn't, I didn't really catch on to this until watching this movie this time. Spectre is basically like Hydra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have the two world powers, but then you have this other faction that's out there that's somewhere underneath. Well, it's an independent you know, terrorism it's, group. It's bent an independent on world terrorism domination. group. You know. Right. It's 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 uh Yeah, it's 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 Cobra. It's uh Right. You know, it's it's any of those. It's working behind the curtain. Right, right. Um yeah, it's it's Hydra, it's 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 any of that. But 
I liked this movie a lot until I saw it this time. Oh, yeah? Um, because for a long time, I regarded this as one of the best oh. early Bond films. Okay. But now I watch it and I'm thinking, it's a long movie. Yeah, it's, it's just under two hours. Yeah, it, it's for a Bond film, it's pretty long. Um, Not as long as the current ones. But, yeah, but the current ones have a better narrative structure. Yeah, this I one argue is with that with some of them. I mean, what was the what was the the, the second one? Uh, with Daniel Craig. Oh, Quantum. Quantum of Solace. Quantum of Solace. Solace. Yes, that was not a good one. No, Spectre. Was Spectre one wasn't particularly good either. Um, mm. it, but yeah, it, this one. Um, uh, I don't. I I don't know what they were really trying to do with this. But I I read the book. The book was basically the first half of it. You know that meeting that they have at the beginning when you're you're with Blofeld mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, was it Lada Lenya? and the um, Kronstein. Um, that's basically half the book. Oh, is wow. them talking about, is them talking about what they're doing. Um, that them sounds like a really boring way to write a book. It, it's, it's a very short book. <laughs> um, and then the back half of it is what happens for the rest of the movie. Um, but it's a lot of expository stuff. And this movie is a lot of expository stuff because it's, there's not, if, when you get down to it, there's not much to it. It's basically Spectre is trying to get this, um, they're trying to get this Lecter device, which is the decoder, which is that, um, oh, what's that, um, Alan Turing, what was that? That device. Oh, uh, yeah. The I, Enigma. Yeah, the Enigma machine. Yeah. It's kind of like the Enigma. It's a decoder. Mm -hmm. Um, to decode Soviet codes, and the um, uh, the British Secret Service wants their wants theirs because wants them wants it because they want to be able to build one of their own. Right. And it's it's essentially a typewriter. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, Basically, they and the other plot, the other uh, motive that they have is they want to send these people to kill James Bond in response to his murder of Dr. No. Right. Right. They want to send Captain Quint. Yeah. Who needs a bigger towel. Richard Grant. Hmm? His name is Grant. Right, right, right. Donald Grant. Right. Um, um, I was going to say, Richard Grant is an actor... And he had nothing to do with this movie. <laughs> it is, it is absolutely, it is Robert Shaw looking like the Aryan ideal. I mean, <laughs> I mean, a golden boy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and. You know, Captain Captain Quint versus James Bond kind of played out around how you would expect it to. Yeah, it did. Um, it did. Yeah, it, it's the the girl in this movie, the woman that they've got, cannot act. She was a no, model. No, but she's she was really not cute. An actress. She is cute. She's adorable, but she cannot act. Uh, she whines a lot. And I, let's be honest, women in spy movies at the time were there for yeah. boobs and whining. I mean, yeah, let's let's be honest here. They're, they the only reason that Ursula Andress was in the first one was so that there could be a girl in a bikini on a beach at the end of the movie. A gorgeous woman yeah. in a bikini. <laughs> and and for the longest time, that's all Bond women were. We're just there for eye candy. 
it wasn't I think it, it wasn't until golden finger they really got into the plot mhm and uh and, and even then when, still when after... Roger Moore came along they got out of the plot yeah well <laughs> they got out of things like plots for Roger Moore <laughs> they didn't really right. <laughs> they didn't really focus too much on on well for narratives. Russell Love it, I said when I, I have lauded it as one of the better early Bond films up until um, until we did it until I watched it for this show and I realize it drags mm -hmm. this movie drags in the middle um, all of that stuff when he goes to um, where the hell is he? Is he in Turkey? Yes, yes all that stuff when yes. he goes to Turkey and the gypsies and all of that stuff it's just, it drags. Yeah, it's like, what the hell is even happening here? And then they're, like, fighting although over a, the... Although I want to say, I was kind of enchanted by that belly dancer. Because that, that belly dancer has some abdominal muscles like nothing I've ever seen in my life. And if you <laughs> if you can't have naked women, apparently the next, the next best thing is to just have them fighting each other. Because there right. are more down-blouse shots in that scene then i think yeah. i can even then then i even can count in the rest of movie history like there it's just constant and that's what it's there for exactly and that's why it, it's well so... it's there because it, it's there because it was in the book but it's also because yeah, but it was in the book so that he could describe women rolling around right na you know right. half naked rolling around on each other um and you know it's it's a cat fight for no reason whatsoever it's just to have gorgeous women yeah, name a cat fight in a movie that was there for a reason other than that right exactly and they play it off here as it's part of their tradition because they're fighting yeah. over a man yeah yeah i mean it's a, it's a, it's the same thing as setting uh setting your scene in a strip club why are you setting right. it there if right. your movie is not about a strip club, there's no reason to go there there's except no reason for it to, be to there. show boobs. Right, right. Like, um, again, the movie just drags. There's there's a half a dozen scenes in this movie that could have gone. This thing could have been just over an hour, and it would have been fine. Right. It could, and it could um, have been it could have been a ninety minute movie and still. But it is held up. a great looking movie. Oh yeah. Um, we get a lot here. We get the first entrance of the the cue that we will know. Mm -hmm. um, and Doctor Novi was played by yeah Desmond Llewellyn, who will play him all the way until the world is not enough. Mm -hmm. um, that's a long, long employment. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's um, to be that reliable in a in a movie is amazing um, because. In these first two movies, his name's Boothroyd, and uh, he's again he played by a different actor in the first one. Here, he's played by Desmond Llewellyn, gives him the most impractical briefcase I've the ever seen in my life. The stupidest thing. <laughs> I mean, a tear gas cartridge that goes off if you open it one way and not the other way. <laughs> I, I got to admit it, with half of Q's, ga Q's gadgets, I would have blown myself up <laughs> at least four times. <laughs> it's it's like the, when, when Archer came back from his coma and mm -hmm. uh, Kruger mm -hmm. gave him his tactile cane. Yeah. And there was, a, there was enough charge in it to stun once. And he mm -hmm. stunned himself. Mm -hmm. And Krieger was like, well, I didn't know you were going to stun yourself or the f burn your charge up on stunning yourself. He's like, always assume that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the other thing. There's nothing in the briefcase. It's like it's it, you just I guess you just assume that your enemies are going to steal this briefcase. I, I don't. I because when you open it, when you turn the catches this way, it opens or, like ordinary. But when you turn them this way, a gas pellet goes off and blows up in your face. Yeah, the 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 um, metal can of talcum powder 
that magnetically latches to the sides so that it's not yeah, I don't know. And I don't know how the latches would even release it because it's not connected to the case at all. Yeah. <laughs> None of that works Whatever out. And, it and is. why in the hell does he have 50 gold sovereigns hidden in this thing when he has an expense account that could buy <laughs> and sell small countries in Europe? You know why? Because the briefcase looks cool. The presentation is really cool, as long as you don't think about it. That's the great. That's the thing about the early. And there's and films, there's that knife that's it. hidden in there. And there's a there's a dagger hidden yeah. in there. You know. <laughs> I again, think the uh, only thing that they ever did that felt practical was the garage mm -hmm. in the uh, in the watch. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that the keep, and the watch, yeah, yeah has that's the only thing that they've ever done that was a feasible and b practical yeah yeah every everything else putting a laser that can actually cut in a watch then yeah. no it'd be hard now yeah <laughs> like <laughs> i don't know they they just always seem so impractical, and the, the only the, reason they have. But yet he still has enemies who are dumb enough to fall for it. Mm, yeah. I always love how they're um, like, oh, you know, we can, well, uh, you know, what 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 went wrong this time? It's like, well, we were we're we're up against Bond. It's like, is he really that good? Because nine chances out of ten, he's usually just walking around somewhere and somebody else blows something up. Mm -hmm. He really doesn't do well, a lot. Connery when is you, uh, When you get to the end of this movie, it's, it's a weird ending because it takes place on a train. Robert Shaw becomes a character actor because he hasn't said a word through the whole movie and then all of a sudden he runs into um he runs into bond pretending to be this other british agent mm -hmm. and again robert shaw becomes a character actor because he 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 sort of turns on the charm mm -hmm. and he becomes very 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 british yeah and there is a scene late late right before um the climax it's like 20 minutes of Robert Shaw explaining the plot. Yeah, yeah, it's just... I mean... <laughs> I was so happy when... When he's like, hey, do you want the Sovereigns? I'm like, oh, good, finally. Oh. <laughs> the tear gas is going to blow up in this guy's face and he's going to shut up. <laughs> felt like Rose Nylon telling a, a St. Olaf story. Like, yes. <laughs> it's like, what's the point, Aesop? Come on! What is the point? <laughs> but he explains the entire plot of this movie to him. It's it's very strange. Um, and then they have I mean, it's, it's nice weird... if you didn't really realize what was happening. They do actually catch you up right when you if need to be. If you did fall be. asleep yeah. somewhere during the movie. Yeah. Which is easy to do because the middle section does drag kind of hard. And there's a uh, there's a weird subplot now in the book. They let you know that Lotelania is is a lesbian mm -hmm. um, because there's that scene where Bond and the girl are having sex and it's behind a two way mirror, mm -hmm. and um, they're watching them. And there's this whole subplot about a film. Yeah, um, what was going on with that? Because he has it at the end, and then he says, well, maybe he was right. I'm like, who's right about what? I don't, what the hell are you talking about? I have no idea. He he has this film that is of the two of them having sex. I'm not really sure how that would, how that would ruin him. Um, Extortion? I mean, everybody Maybe. in the world knows that he fucks every woman he winds up with. <laughs> I don't know how this is going to be damaging for him. If anything, it does better for his reputation. It's like, oh, hey, yeah, he got her. You know, and she was just waiting in and bed then, for him. 
he throws the he throws the thing in the water at the end and destroys it. Well, he he throws it into a Venetian canal. Destroying it is a little much. You could you could you could dig that up and put it in a projector and it would work just fine. Maybe, maybe. Um, but it's it's not as good as I remember it because, like I say, it does drag. There's a lot to it, but I think things get a little better with our next film, which is uh, Goldfinger. Goldfinger's my favorite Connery uh, Bond movie. Yeah, mine too. Um, although it is so ridiculous, but although don't take a deep dive into Goldfinger's plot oh, no. because because if you do, <laughs> it'll give you a headache. It's not. It doesn't uh, make any sense whatsoever. It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense, but it sounds cool when they're explaining it. Right. B- um, basically, what he he wants to. I love this. He wants to this. irradiate. He wants to irradiate. <laughs> The American gold (laughs) stockpile in Fort Knox (laughs) so that it devalues it and makes what he has more valuable because there's less gold in the world. We don't trade gold. No. And we're not even on a gold standard. We weren't even, we weren't on the gold standard. uh, Lincoln took us off the gold standard during the Civil War. We never went back. We have gold in Fort Knox, but we don't, it's not, that's not our economy. The, 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 The reason that it's there is because early on when the dollar was being established and, uh, many countries did this in Europe, they would have the amount of money that they had circulating mm-hmm. in gold so that every penny that was in circulation had some kind of a something behind it that said, yes, this is worth this. Yeah. Right. Which, uh, helped keep inflation down um, because Mm -hmm. if you needed to print more money you needed to mine and cast more gold and uh, but by the same token why does gold mean anything you know why 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 does gold have a worth because it's shiny Mm -hmm. I think that's all it is things that were the same things things that were shiny yeah but why is it precious because it's shiny. Because it's rare. Because it's mm-hmm. shiny. Right. Do you know how much there's? Do you? The only reason that gold, silver, bronze, diamonds, that shit is uh, expensive, is because the uh, the supply is controlled. It's not because mm-hmm. there's not a lot. It's because it's controlled so that people have so that people can make more money off of. Them. Right. So I mean, if they if they went through and said, okay, every diamond in the world has to be put on the market or in somebody's hand, it would be it would be cheaper to buy a real diamond than it would be to buy a cubit zirconia. Right. Um. So his plan. Now I don't understand why irradiating gold set off a nuclear device. Why nuclear is device. irradiating gold going to devalue it though? They're not spending it. They're not putting it out in here. If they just put an extra layer of concrete, it's it's fine. Let me put it this way. I went into this conversation hoping you could explain this to me. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I racked my brain trying to figure this out. It doesn't make why any does he sense bring, at all. Why does he bring the heads of the five families into his lair? Why does he bring the heads of his for the five families into his lair? And give them this elaborate $10 million presentation. Beautiful $10 million presentation. Why does he need any of them? (laughs) And look, Gold Members Plan had more sense to it than Gold Fingers Plan. And all Gold Member wanted to do was paint people's wangs gold because of an unfortunate smelting accident. Basically, what he wanted to do in the book was he wanted to use 
um, the American mafia syndicate as a conduit to help get his money out of the country. Oh, now, see, um, that makes sense. See, they don't, they don't tell you that in the movie. No. You just see this bunch of yahoos standing around in a room watching this $10 million presentation, and then they're, and then they're bumped off. Yeah. But he wanted to use the American crime circuit, bring in the heads of the five families, to um, he's he's going to fill their coffers. He's going to he's going to make them billionaires, mm-hmm. and they're going to help him with this plan to steal from Fort Knox. And that's that should have been mentioned here, right? And it. it... So the, why the do they take just... the one guy who wants out? Odd job puts him in a car and drives him miles away, and then pulls over and t- turns around and shoots the guy. Turns the car into a. Oh yeah, and then just gets um, up and leaves, and, and it just they just take it. I want to know. And there's a case of gold in the back trunk. And they take the cube that they crush the car into and bring it back to the horse stable. Right. They put it in the car. And then it... Look, I don't... That may, that makes no first, sense to me. First of all, I can't even imagine the cost of keeping 24-7 a car compactor staffed and on for whenever yeah. you might need it. Right. Like, who has that kind of money? I figured he had the Koreans waiting for it. Was it the Koreans or the Chinese? I think it was the Chinese that he had waiting for it. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, the the because uh, he had this he had this small army of um, of of Chinese soldiers mm-hmm. helping him with this plan. So I figured they were the ones running the junkyard. I, 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 I have no idea. I don't know. I mean, every every everybody in uh, every every criminal mastermind in the '60s and '70s had access to a car crusher. Right. Uh, it seems apparently. Yeah. yeah. Whenever they needed but, it, like you just drive up and say, "Hey, crush this car," and they do. That's not how that works. Right. <laughs> that's not how that works. <laughs> that's not how that works. I mean, I know that you know. Realism isn't something that you go to for in a Bond movie, and yeah, which is why you have a woman named Pussy Galore. Exactly. <laughs> Although, and surprisingly, that is not the dirtiest name in this series. I, I, I'm sorry, but we've still got Holly Goodhead, Honey Rider. Honey Rider was yeah, in one of the first Honey ones. Rider. Yeah, we've got Holly Goodhead in Moonraker. So, I mean. We're, and there's a whole movie about octopussy. Yes, yes. That's my little octopussy, yes. I, I don't... Yes. <laughs> I love how this is the only time that he ever looks surprised at such a such a ridiculous name. Like, mm-hmm. when I she says it, yeah, he says it, he, She's and he's like, okay. How many times did they have to film that? So that Sean Connery would laugh because you can tell, you can see him stifling a laugh when she says that. And he's a good actor. He's a very focused actor, but you can see him stifling a laugh when she says that. Well, I mean, (laughs) put yourself in his shoes and somebody, take after take, what's your name? Pussy Galore. And it's this gorgeous blonde, and you're just like, um, okay. (laughs) I mean, how they got away with that, I, I'm i impressed that yeah. that, that got, got... They got that past the British censors? Yeah. <laughs> you know what the funny thing is, though? This is an American franchise. It, it's Ameri- it has American distribution. It's American money. It's MGM. Yeah. It's American money, but it's all made in England. Well, it was United Artists. Yeah. And the movie, the movies are so very American, mm-hmm. despite being British. Yeah. Only in recent years with Daniel Craig have they tried to make them more British. Roger Moore was British. Mm. Timothy Dalton was British. 
Uh, George Lazenby was Australian. Connery was Scottish. You know what? George Lazenby wasn't bad either. He was. I kind of like Honor movie. Majesty's Secret Service. It's a. It's it's okay. It's just. It, it's it. The problem with that movie was timing. Um, it's the first movie after Connery. Um, George Lazenby looks way too much like Connery. Yeah, and he's he's uh, it's it's way too much like you're 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 dealing with his stunt double. And it's a really 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 talky movie. It's a very talky movie, yeah. And it's trying to do something different, you know, with the with the wife and all it, of that. Right, right. And I admire them for trying that and maybe they shouldn't have abandoned it because they probably mm-hmm. could have gotten more out of it if they'd have, you know, stuck with it. Mm-hmm. But um they drove six six dump trucks full of money up in front of Sean Connery's house and voila Thunderball. <laughs> no, uh, diamonds are forever. diamonds are forever. That's right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is an exciting movie. Goldfinger is a very exciting movie. It, it is. It's functionally it is not functionally it doesn't work, but as an entertainment. It's damn exciting. It has moments. I love that golf game. Oh yeah, this is this is the first Bond that you can say is more of an action movie than an espionage mm-hmm. movie. The first two were largely espionage. Mm-hmm. Goldfinger is not. They're they're espionage, but they're trying to stretch a two-hour movie into a fifteen-minute plot. Mm-hmm. Um, because Dr. No and From Russia With Love are very, very short books. And they're written in a way that is extremely difficult to adapt. Goldfinger is a movie that really gives us the tenets of this series. Um, the girl with the porn star name, the, um, the villain in the world domination plot, the... Um, the opening sequence yeah. with the titles over the over the the bodies. We we haven't quite gotten to the um, we haven't got quite gotten to the underwater naked women swimming around. Um, wow. We've gotten to the ridiculous plot that probably the villain could have. You know, we really need to spend tens of millions of dollars putting in putting into place. Seriously, Gold, easily... Goldfinger spends <laughs> so much money on. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> On a plan that's just not going to work. <laughs> but I'm and it tell doesn't you make any sense to boot. It's like, e- even if the plan isn't going to be able to be executed, mm-hmm. why was it even c- come up with in the first... Why was it even thought of in the first place? It's a stupid plan. But I'll tell you this. I love the byplay between... Bond and Goldfinger, because this is the first time that we have a villain that you sense is as smart as Bond. Yes, and not because not just um, because Doctor No was clearly a genius. He was a terrible genius, but but you could you could feel the powers above his head. You could feel his superiors. Right, right. Somewhere else, but I mean the it just on the science level. But he wasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, criminally a match for right goldfinger i know they wanted blofeld to be but in my mind goldfinger um is kind of his moriarty yeah more so than blofeld well, i love how goldfinger thinks in in terms of when they're raiding fort knox he's got the chinese with him to help him out and then he just takes him out. Yeah. It's a very mafia thing. He just takes him out. It's like, I'm going to get rid of you. It's like that scene, remember that scene in Goodfellas? It's mm-hmm. like, we're going to do the, the Lufthansa heist. Yeah. And then I'm going to get rid of everybody else and keep it all for myself. Right. It's that It's that kind of thing. I love when he basically leaves them all there to die. And then he goes off in a corner. He's wearing a top coat. He goes off in a corner takes the coat off and he's wearing a military uniform puts on the cap and then goes out and everybody the americans think that he's a general Mm -hmm. and he helps execute the guys he brought in to help yeah 
so that he can escape. That's brilliant. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's um, <laughs> I, 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 Goldfinger. <laughs> He's just good. That whole plot mm-hmm. could be readapted into a Batman movie. Yeah. A damn good Batman movie mm-hmm. to boot. Um, that would be interesting. I'd like to see that now. This is a movie that's very good in moments. I love that. Um, I love that golf game. Because it's it's this brain, it's this this. Um, it, it's a, both of them cheat. It's a chess. It's game. It's just Bond cheats. Be- Bond well, cheats better. Bond. Bond cheats only because Goldfinger was going to. Right. So I love the scene where they're talking and you're looking up at Goldfinger. And then he looks down because he's put, he's um, he's putting, and he looked down and he says, "What's in it for you?" And he looks down at the hole, and all of a sudden that gold bar just kind of comes yeah into frame. I love that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like he doesn't have to say a word. It's that bar of Nazi gold that he's got, and he knows how deep into his business he is. Mm-hmm. Um, I love those moments. I love. <laughs> I love the other co-star in this movie that nobody ever talks about. And that's the Aston Martin DB5. Yeah. <laughs> that car is gorgeous. Again, you were talking about... Um, uh, you were talking about the briefcase. Okay, the big thing about this is he announces that he... The Q announces that he has put in an ejector seat. Yeah, don't ever push this button. Don't ever push this button. It's an ejector seat. Why did okay. you put it in if you didn't want him to be able to use it? And what happens if the villain gets in the back seat? <laughs> is there a back seat in an Aston Martin? I think I think there is I think there's a back seat. I think there's a back seat. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. And then I mean and this is done. This is, uh, what's it, Guy Hamilton's Mm -hmm. first Bond film. Yeah. Um, Terrence Young did the first two, and then I did one or two others. They just kind of changed this one up, and they made it, um, I mean, the plot isn't any more airtight, but it's a little, it's, it's, it's got a better narrative structure. Yeah. Uh, than the other ones do. This one's just kind of... Um, this one's a lot tighter. Mm-hmm. There are moments in the film that I think are very strange. There's a moment early on... The girl that gets painted with gold. Yeah. Um, before she is murdered. He oh, tells no, that's, her, that's what murders her. That's I've always loved well, before, that. Before she's murdered, he, he has a weird line where he's talking about... You can't open the Chateau Briand too early. It would be like listening to the Beatles without earmuffs. Yeah. That's a weird line here. It just, every time I hear that, it kind of takes me out of the movie. Because I'm like, okay, the Beatles apparently exist in this universe. I think, I think it's, he's just basically, to me, all that is saying, you know, this is no good if you, if you don't chill it to the right temperature just like the beetles are no good right that's that's a weird it's a very weird line it was an attempt to it, make things contemporary but you don't ever get that explicitly in, um contemporary within this universe no that's this is largely a fantasy universe mm-hmm. um well, how could it be a fantasy without the beetles what i want to know is that that's true that's very true. What I want to know is um, his motivation because when that when Goldfinger kills that girl for a long time, Bond is pissed off. It's almost like he had like some kind of an emotional attachment to her, but you know that he didn't. What I thought was either he had an emotional attachment with her, or. He's angry with himself because he couldn't save her. 
that's just a little bit. You know, that that's a little bit. Um, they don't they don't lean on it right too much, really until the sister shows up, mm-hmm. and the sister's not really in it that much. Um, but it's just a little bit. It's like he's he's angry with himself, mm-hmm. or was he kind of in love with her? That that's a that's a very it's a very small thing in the movie, but they don't really lean on it. But it's it's it, it's an interesting touch. It is. I can definitely see. Yeah, it's. He's not broken up about the sister. <laughs> no. He couldn't care less. Um, he couldn't care less. But this is the one thing, um, and going back and watching these again that I realized that was missing from the Roger Moore movies is this steely toughness mm-hmm. uh, laced with moments of, of sort of this vulnerability uh, that peaks out from time to time. And it's in Connery's performance. Mm-hmm. Um, it shows up from time to time, but it's, um, and I think it really starts here. Um, but that scene in Dr. No when he's sitting in his bungalow and he's sitting in that chair and he pulls out the gun with a silencer and he just shoots that man dead. Yeah. That's Bond. Yeah. That's Connery's Bond. Roger Moore wouldn't do that. Um, it, it, Roger Moore just, just had a different... It, it, his character was just in a different place. Right. Um, but the steely toughness, which they definitely brought back by the handful... Mm-hmm. by a handfuls with the Daniel Craig movies mm-hmm. um, because they can't have him screw every woman in Europe. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> although, you know, he's still... Um, he's he's still very careless mm-hmm. with his penis. Yeah. He's... he's he... But if you watch the Craig films and then you follow them up with the Bonner, with the Connery films... The character does kind of fit because you see where he becomes a little more cautious. Mm-hmm. Um, you see where uh, he is careless in Casino Royale. That's what I love about that film is that he is vulnerable and he is careless. Mm-hmm. And he has to learn. I love that stuff. Um, but it's a very, very interesting series it's a very interesting progression and we're going to get more into it as we as we go along we'll probably we might do volume two i don't know maybe in january or something but um that'll be the next three um connery films but um anyway that's that's pretty much all i got that's all i got um what do we have coming up what do we have coming up um i don't even know what next week is is it october is it october yet no (laughs) It is not. It is not. It is not. It is my second pick for September, mm-hmm. which I had not yet announced, but I have settled upon uh, Jackie Brown. Jackie Brown, yes. Because, uh, well, because it's Jackie Brown. That's an interesting film in, in Tarantino's canon because it's not. It's a nice, respectful mixture of both Tarantino and Elmore Leonard. It's 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 the only adaptation he's ever done. Right, and, and it's he's a very respectful. Damn good adaptation. I yeah. I've read the screenplay and I've attempted to read the book. I could not read the book because it was just like rereading the screenplay. Like I I, right. I was just get going into it. And I'm like I can't. Except for the fact that Jackie Brown in the book is white. Well, there's that. Yeah. And it's not in L.A. Mm -hmm. I think it's in Florida or something. Yeah. I don't remember where it is. Um, Cabo San Lucas. No, it's out in L.A. No, the movie's movie's in L.A. Mm -hmm. The book isn't. It's been years since I read the book. I, what I remember, like, he, Tarantino was nervous because, uh, Elmore Leonard called him after he read the script, I think, and Tarantino was convinced that he would be angry with him. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, because I 
changed the race of Jackie and moved it to L.A. Mm. And Elmore Leonard's like, are you kidding? All of that works perfectly. <laughs> like, this is this is the best adaptation of any of my work ever. And you know what? It probably is. Um, there is one thing, because it's... Honestly, it might be my favorite Tarantino. I know, I know I'm alone in this, but it might be my favorite Tarantino. There is one, if you'll excuse the term, black eye that the movie has. Is that that movie has a very, 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 very persistent use of the N-word. Yeah. And I know it is mostly from Sam Jackson, but still, it's peppered I don't know if it was in the script or if it was just Sam Jackson but it is peppered throughout that movie um, and that has always bothered me <laughs> just, but that's just me I only I you know at, at, at this point um, I only tend to hear that word as that word when a white person says it if a black person says it, I don't even flinch. I don't... I do. I, I flinch I, when anybody says it. I... I. The way that I process it is obviously going to be very different from the way you would process it. Right. But, I mean, I, I wind up seeing and hearing a lot of uh, movies and shows and podcasts and things like that where African Americans will regularly use that mm -hmm. as just another word. Right. So it's it's one of those things where you have to be you eventually get used to it, but you have to be mindful of it so that you're not too used to it and forget that you shouldn't be saying the word if you look like us. <laughs> it it still bothers me. It still, I, I once, twice, Sam Jackson might say it. I would hear it. But you know that in Jackie Brown, when he's talking to Chris Tucker, it is every other word. It's like it's so peppered into that into that dialogue. Like I say, I don't know if that's Tarantino. I don't know if that's Sam Jackson ad libbing. But well. It still bugs look, me. Look back on Pulp Fiction and uh, Quentin Tarantino's role and the amount of times he says that word in that mm -hmm. eight-minute scene. Mm -hmm. um, and then look at... Uh, it ain't the coffee in my kitchen, it's the... Yeah, the dead... The dead brother in the... Does, <laughs> does, is there a sign on my house that says dead storage? Brother storage, yeah. And um, <laughs> as you go along, um, Django Unchained uses it a lot, but that's that's period appropriate. That's a civil war. I'm I, I I'm that's pre -Civil I'm okay war. there. Um, it's pre civil war. I'm I'm okay there. But um, you know, I I think it's said to an alarming degree in The Hateful Eight, and there was just Sam Jackson there. But that's post-Civil War. Um, I think in the context... See, Jackie Brown is contemporary. Mm -hmm. What I'm really getting... What I really get down to with that is that I was thrilled that Robert Forrester was nominated for the Oscar. Yes. R.I.P. Um, I was thrilled. I was aggravated that neither Pam Greer or Sam Jackson Pam got Greer. A nomination. We'll talk about her next week. Um, <laughs> but and she lost to Helen Hunt in a nothing performance. Yeah, yeah. I still, I still scratch my head at the as good as it gets wins. Yeah, I like the movie well enough. It's way too long. Um, and it comes to an ending that is trying to fit a, a, a round peg in a square hole. Yeah, 
yeah, it, it, it the resolution is not that good. But parts, of, right. I, I liked it when I saw it in the theater, and I've seen it a couple of times on DVD. Oh, yeah, I laughed when I saw yeah, it in the yeah, theater. Yeah, 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 it's, just... it's, a, it's a funny movie. It's just, you know, I've I've seen Jack do better performances in his sleep. I've seen him do better performances at the Oscars. Yeah. Like, the fact that he did not look quizzically and say, really, when he announced Crash as the Best Picture winner? Mm-hmm. That's that's talent right there. Yeah. <laughs> and the Oscar goes to Crash. And he wasn't he wasn't even nominated for that. And he should have been. For what? Or no, um for um Departed, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm the he wrong should year. have been nominated for the Departed. He should have been nominated for the Departed. He completely they lost him. They they missed out. Yeah, because that was a, that was a terrific performance. Yeah, it was Martin Sheen probably that was him playing. That was Jack Nicholson basically playing Danny DeVito in Goodfellas. <laughs> Danny DeVito, <laughs> or um, Joe Pesci. Uh, Joe Pesci, yeah, that was him playing. Yeah, yeah, or a or a, a non Didn't fall right. <laughs> Jesus Francis, you should see somebody. I love The Departed. I'm I'm one yeah. of the few people that I I I I adore it. I know that it's not one of Marty's upper echelon movies, but I still love I'm it. I'm very sticky about Marty Martin Scorsese getting out of New York. I'm very very sticky about that. It has to be something special. Like Hugo. And I never felt like the I never felt like The Departed was special. Anyway, Hugo is though. All right. Anyway, we'll see you next week. Yes, uh, you can catch all of our uh, back episodes of the Pod Bay Doors podcast at wordpress dot com. Uh, you can listen to us on iTunes and YouTube. Hit the like, subscribe, and uh, make sure you get the notifications. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter and Patreon, both at Pod underscore Bay. Uh, that's where we are. Where right now, over on Patreon, we do have the Citizen Kane. Um, patreon exclusive posted so uh we encourage you to go over and uh take a listen to that uh if you can we would greatly appreciate that we thank you so very much for joining us and now the pod bay doors are now closed the mission has been completed you